Well, thank you guys. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to come here and talk to you guys a little bit about the GRE. And the, I'm going to talk a little bit about GMAT as well, um, because some of you may consider business school as a possible route rather than just going to grad school. You can do grad school and business school, because some of you guys are going to be starting your own businesses in the future. So um, GMAT's also an important test in doing that. Um, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Doug McLemore. I've been with the Princeton Review since... About 2007, it's hard to say, it's a little fuzzy, that was, that was a long time ago, but before that I was a faculty member at Colorado State University, a long time ago, taught chemistry, taught some astronomy, taught some physics, and um, I kind of saw, well I did admissions at that point, I helped do admissions for people coming into our grad programs, and saw that there's a lot of problems with tests like the GRE, I mean the GRE is what we have to get into um, grad schools, and people just weren't ready for it. Um, the students would come to us and, and be, you know, they'd have really good qualifications, but then a very low quantitative uh, score on the GRE. So we had a really great looking applicant for everything else except for that annoying little test score. And so I decided I'd come work over with the test prep side of things. So that's how I got from Colorado State University to Pension Review. So that's where I've been ever since. And this is what I do. My life is all about test prep. And if I can just share a quote with you, Einstein once said, it's, he wasn't, he, he didn't really, he was a very relatively modest man. He didn't think I'm a genius or anything like that. He just said that in order to play the game, you got to learn the rules and then just play the game better than everybody else. And that's essentially what these standardized tests are all about, is learn how the test works, learn all the tricks, because their job is to like, make you get things wrong. If you know how they're putting these tests together, then you go in there and just rock the house. You, just, you, you have no worries at all. And the funny thing is, they're not even testing you on stuff that you need for your grad school. It's just completely different material, as we're going to see. So, um, first we'll talk a little about the um, big grad test. I know I have MCAT and LSAT up there. I'm not going to talk about those today. Or if you have questions about them, I can always answer that. But um, then we'll talk a little bit about like, some of the misconceptions about testing and all that stuff. And, and I'll mention some of the things that if you decide to go to test prep route, that Prince Review can help you out with. So... Um, just a quick run through. These are the, what we call the big four of the grad tests. Uh, what is MCAT all about? Med school. Med school. So any, any future doctors here? I know most of you are STEM, so you're probably not planning on going to be a doctor. So doctor philosophy, but different kind of doctor. MD, PhD. So we won't talk that at all with the MCAT because you guys you don't sound like you're the MCAT type of crowd. Um, what's the GRE for? That's just grad school, period. So if you're going to get that master's degree or that PhD, you're going to need the GRE to get into those schools. GMAT? Now I want your business school test. So, and that's what you're going to need to do doing that MBA. If you want to do an MBA and you want to you know, go off and make your own little business, that's the way you're going to have to do that. And then, of course, LSAT, uh, law school. Now, any future like uh, engineering lawyers... Totally intellectual property. That's an LSAT because you got to be doing law. Um, that's a great opportunity that if you want to go back to law school after you've been in the business for a while, you can become a consultant on court cases. You can become an actual litigator on court cases. So LSAT is what you need to do to do that. So um, afterwards, like during the break, I can talk to you since it sounds like you might be one of the only ones about LSAT here. But I can give you some info about that as well. So, what test do you guys plan to take? How many here plan to take the GRE? So, well, but wait, going to grad school is what? Free. Free. So, why didn't everybody raise your hand? Should all be planning on taking this test for that reason, right? How many people are thinking GMAT eventually is some, somewhere in their future? Okay, a handful. All right. So, any, like, we got our, our one law. Any other people thinking they're going to go the law route? You? So, LSAT. So, I, I'll actually pop a little bit of LSAT here at the end. So, um, maybe just for kicks and giggles, any MD, M, MDs? No? Okay, no MCAT. So first, let's skip through that. Boom, 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 And talk about the GRE, because all that was MCAT stuff. So the GRE is a test written by ETS. Anybody recognize those guys, ETS? 
they write everything, right? So they, they write the AP tests, and so they, you know, those guys write a lot of these tests. So GRE is written by the same guys that try to trick you into getting bad grades on everything, right? So that's a good thing to know because they're going to be similar in nature. The same kinds of questions are going to come from them. Um, the GRE itself is not one of those tests where you have to pick a date and then wait for that date. Um, you can take it pretty much any time as long as the, a testing center near you can accommodate you. So what that means is whenever you want to take the GRE, which we'll talk about in just a moment, you can just sign up for a test date and um, you can make it, it could be June 1st, it could be January 15th, it could be July 22nd. It doesn't matter as long as uh, they have space available for you. And you can take the jury multiple times. And that's one of the things I think some people get worried of, worried about, is like, do I have to just do it once and have my best score? The nice thing about the GRE is that many schools, many programs, a lot of the programs the granting institutions might be running are going to allow you to take it multiple times and they'll do what we call super scoring. Kind of like what you saw with SATs and ACTs when you were in high school. So if you take the GRE and you get a really bad verbal score and you got an awesome quant score, go ahead and take the GRE again. You, and here's the cool thing about it, just do the verbal section. Do the verbal sections, and then who cares about the quant score because they're going to stack it. Now, that all comes with a caveat. Pay attention to the program that you're applying to. Ask them what they suggest you should do with those scores. But the GRE is a lot more forgiving than a lot of the other standardized tests out there. So it's very nice in that respect. Did you have a question there? No, no. I, you answered Okay, it's about the super scoring. So scores are reported by section. So we have the verbal score, which is 130 through 170, and the same with the quant, which is 130 through 170. So what do you guys think is the median score, the 50th percentile score here? 150. 150. So if you don't get a 150, like the minimum threshold is get a 150 or higher on both sections. If you don't get a 150 or higher, that's not going to get you in, into a grad school. Now, another interesting thing about this, there's a third section of the test that I don't have up here. What section is that? There's a writing section. There's an essay, actually a couple essays that you got to write for the GRE. That is actually scored on a, a two point or a six point scale that's separated into half point increments. Like you get a, you get a zero for basically writing gobbledygook. You get a three for writing okay. You get a six for writing very uh, mediocre. Now listen to what I said there. You get a six for writing mediocre. You get a five for writing really well. So that's kind of a funny thing about the way this thing is scored. The more sophisticated your writing style is on the GRE, the tendency is you could reach a maximum of around five, and then it drops off. Because what they're looking for is, well, there's two graders. You have one computer grading your test, and you have one human grading your test. So the computer, when it looks at your essay, is looking for things like structural details, proper grammar, proper spelling. So if you have a conclusion and you write in conclusion, guess what? While you're, what does your English teacher tell you about that? Never write. Never write in conclusion in an essay, right? What do you need to get a perfect score on a uh, GRE essay? Write things like in conclusion. First, next, last, all those constructs your English teacher said, never write that way. Well, here's the time to use those because it only helps the computer find those pieces of information. So if you write really, really well, that's great. You can, you're going to get a 5, 5.5, but to get that 6, you've got to like tone it down a little bit. Really complicated sentence structure gets in the way. So keep it simple. Keep your words a little bit shorter. You don't want to have like $5 words where a 25-cent word will do. Like, what's the better word? Use, utilize. Just use use. You don't have to utilize use, but use use. Because it's just a better word for something like this. The human graders is great in this thing like as fast as humanly possible. They're going to miss everything. Unless you keep it simple structure. Yeah. Well, it's not, the six is the best score, but five is what the best writers tend to get. They cap out on five, five and a half. Well, the funny thing is, here's the, here's the kicker on the writing section. Most of you guys are going to be going to a science program, right? 
are most of those science programs really worried about what you get on your writing section? No. Not at all. So they pretty much are going to go like, who cares? Um, if you got a three or higher, you're good to go. So that's, that's the long and short of the GRE. They tend not to care about the writing score for, for grad schools. Now, if you're talking Stanford, something like that, or Harvard, okay, yeah, then your writing score is going to have more weight. But again, it's a very program-dependent thing. Yeah? Uh, two questions. First question is, um, in regards to the writing, if you write things such as first, next, last, things like that, could you get a very good score on your computer analysis, but then a mediocre score on your like person analysis? That's a great question, but considering these people that grade the test get graded by how many tests they do. Uh -huh. right, so they're getting paid by test. So therefore, they're going to grade them really, really fast. Yeah. So the harder it is for them to read it and understand it, the harder it is for you to get a higher score. Okay. So like, basically, if you talk to a GRE essay re uh, grader, what they have is they have a checklist. And they are checking things off that they can find. Look for this in the essay. Look for this in the essay. Look for this in the essay. And they, as, as long as they find all these pieces, you're pretty OK. So don't try to strive for really excellent writing. Learn the formula, follow the formula, get the, get the score. That's what you got to do. Again, learn the rules so you can just play the game better than everyone else. That's what we're here to do, right? Yes, sir. All right. So now, again, scoring-wise, as far as schools are concerned, if you're going into a science major, you're going into engineering school, which section is the one that they're more concerned about? They're more worried about the quantitative score. That's the one where you really want to shoot for getting that 90th percentile or higher. 90th percentile or higher, that's pretty much going to get you to the program you want to go to. And anything above that is going to get you additional funding. So those programs like uh, the previous speaker was talking about, they're looking in a lot of cases for 90th percentile plus scores. So really getting up there in the 165 range and higher on the quant section. Now for the, the verbal, for again, depending on the program, depending on the school, you may only have an expectation to get a 150. If you can get a 150, you have no problems on the verbal. So uh, the biggest lesson I can teach you right here, if you're taking the GRE for a particular purpose, research it, call admissions offices, call up the places that are going to give you the funding, and ask them, what do I need to get on my GRE? Because every single school is going to give you a slightly different answer. There's no magic numbers on the GRE. Like, uh, again, it's a little, uh, little bit like the same for ACT, SAT. There's no magic numbers. you got to just... Figure out where you're going and what you want to do with it. So talk to the schools. They want to talk to you, by the way. And if you call them, that goes in your record that, hey, this person's proactive. They're interested in this program. Let's talk to them some more. So they'll, get, like, they'll see that as interest in their program. So that's a good thing to do, talk to the admissions offices. Now, here's a crazy thing. This is what's called a CAT, a Computer Adaptive Test. So... This is a little bit scary, but again, if you learn how the program or how the system works, it's not too bad. If you do poorly on the first set of questions, what's going to happen as you go? The question is going to get easier or the question is going to get harder? Easier. The question is going to get easier. Is that a good thing? No. no. That's not a good thing. If the questions get easier, that tells you you're going to get a lower score on this test. So you pray that your questions don't get easier. Because if your questions get harder, then you're doing it the right way. If your questions get easier, you're going to net out a net lower score. So, and there's a, an interesting trick the way it works. It's good that it's adaptive by section. So you've got two verbals and you've got two maths. So you have one whole section to establish the baseline. And then the next section that you get will establish what your final grade is going to be. And um, so we'll look at, oh, let's look at that right now. So I look at the uh, adaptive by section nature. The first section you're going to get in verbal or quant is medium. All the questions are going to be around the same difficulty, medium kind of questions. You might get some higher, some lower. Don't worry about it at this point. But what is your job on this section to do? To get as many questions done as possible or to get as many questions answered correctly as possible? answered correctly. So if you don't answer all the questions in the section before time runs out, that's okay. 
Your job is to get as many of those questions that you do answer correct. So if you see a question, you're just like, oh, my mind is blown. I have no idea what they're asking me to do here. What do you do? Skip it. But you don't just skip it. What do you do before you skip it? Mark it and give it an answer. Like, actually answer it. Get rid of bad, like, ridiculous answer choices. Like, there's going to be some answers out there, like, uh, you're going to look at it and go, like, there's no way this is possible. Cross the answer choice out. Pick from the remaining answer choices. And boom, there you go. You've got that question now down to, like, maybe 30 per, or, uh, 33% chance of getting it correct. But whatever the case is, you only spent... 30 seconds on that one question, and you exchange that for time for questions you can get right. And that's the key. Because if you're getting lots and lots of questions right, you do well on that section, you just targeted the mostly hard section two, which is what you want. Because by the time you get the mostly hard question section two, your minimum score is 150. Your minimum score. So that's where you, that's where you want to be. Take the time. Get all those, get as many questions correct as possible. Skip the ones that you're not going to get correct, that you've already anticipated that. You're already minimum at that 50th percentile or above, and then everything beyond that is gravy. Now you just work, work the way you would normally work on a test, and you'll get the score that you're going to get. So that's the best way to approach it. What you don't want to have happen is this. You, you did okay, because then all of a sudden you get a medium section. If the question difficulty is about the same, then, uh-oh, your median grade is 150. You're, you, you can't get above a 160. So that's not where you want to be. 160 or above, that's 80th percentile and up. So you want to get in this chunk. And then if you do poorly, that basically sets your floor down at the lowest score, 130, and gets you up to a maximum of 50th percentile. So if your second section is just like uh, softball questions, what's one plus one? They would never ask that on a jury. But like, <laughs> what's one plus one? Then you know you're in this realm. So you may at that point kind of, you know, all right, I'm going to do the best I can, but you don't let it frustrate you because you still got another half to go. You still got your verbal to go. So the big trick is slow and steady wins the race up here. Don't rush through this first section just to get all the questions done. Do all the questions that you can do correctly, and that's going to maximize your score. Yeah? So you still advise answering every single question, just more strategically, more strategically planning like the questions that you answer for that first section? Correct. Okay. That's exactly right. So let me reset, re restate what he said. Be strategic about the questions that you spend more time on. So don't waste time with questions that are way too hard for you. Spend the time on the questions that you can get done quickly and easily. And those are the ones that are going to get you up to the highest score. It's all about strategy. Again, what was that first thing Einstein said? Learn the rules and play better than everyone else. So these are the rules of how the test works. You just play within those rules and you're good to go. Yeah? So for section two, should we um, try and answer as many correctly as possible? In, in section two, answering as many correctly as possible is still a good advisable technique. It's just not going to net out the same result as, as you might get from the first section. So, um, plus, the problem with section two is, since there's an experimental section on the test, and if you have three math sections, you're not sure if it's section two or if it's experimental. So try the, like basically on the second section, it's advisable to do the best you can. So let me talk about the experimental section for a minute. So, every test has the analytical writing, comes up first. You got those two essays, boom. Quantitative, you got two sections, one before the break, one after the break. You've got verbal, one before the break, one after the break. And they've got experimental, which comes after the break. So the tricky part about this is, if your experimental section is verbal, then you'll get three verbal sections. So you'll have before the break, and then two after the break. There's no way for you to know that second section, whether it's the experimental section or it's the real section. So you gotta treat all the sections you run into as the real deal. And it also what makes it so you don't know if you're gonna have multiple quants or not. So the second section you hit after the break, and potentially third, you have to take and basically there, just try to answer uh, as many questions as you can. That's the be it works better that way. 
when you do the second section because of that experimental nature. So uh, it, at least in the short term, GRE's, uh, or ETS is not going to do away with the experimental section and they're still not going to identify it. So that is a problem with this thing, but you know, just focus, buckle down, do as, as many of those questions as you can to maximize your score on the second section. Does that answer your question? What exactly is the point of the experimental section? Ugh, good question. So why do they do this? Why do testing companies do this, period? Like, you've actually been being experimented on your whole lives. Like, when you sign that little agreement, when you take all these tests, you're signing the rights away to, like, the fact that they're going to have questions on those tests. They're trying out for the future. So these are questions that somebody two or three years from now are going to be asked. So they're seeing what the results are so they can standardize them and figure out how it affects the overall score. So, and the, the thing is, they just don't want you to know because people, if they know, are going to... What are you going to do on an experimental section if you know it's experimental? Not do it or just like, do as bad as possible on purpose. So that's why they don't tell you so they can do it. Yeah? So I'm trying to see if this is a myth or not and when mm -hmm. it comes to the grading. Because there is a 40 point differential between the 130 and 170. Yep. And there are 20 questions on each section. So in total, it will be 40 questions for verbal and you have a 40 point span. Is it true that you get one point for each question and then it's nah, so, it nah. doesn't? It doesn't work that way, okay. unfortunately. It's not a linear, like, however many questions you get correct will help determine your score. Because some questions are going to be weighted more heavily than others, and they're not going to tell you what those are. So the, the GRE is very algorithmic in how it generates a score. It's not saying, here's the number correct, here's the score. It's, here's the number and the style of question, you know, statistics, spreadsheets, blah, 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 here comes a score. So like, there's no simple formula. We've ever been, like, nobody's been able to deduce their scoring formula at this point. Because it's, it's very confusing. Although it's easier than the GMAT. So not one-to-one, -one, unfortunately. Okay, because um, a quick follow-up was mm -hmm. I was sending a practice GRE through the ETS website. Right. And from what I can recollect, it was a one-on-one -on -one correlation between the amount of questions I answered correctly and my actual score. But I don't know if that was because it was a practice or what. Um, I believe that's because it's a practice test. That's what we've also found with the GRE's... Um, public facing ones mm -hmm. uh, the ones that they the, there's an actual jury program that they offer that you have to pay for that actually doesn't go linearly like that okay. so it is more representative of the uh, adaptive nature of the test so um, that's usually a lot of times if you see practice tests they're, they're not super representative if you don't have to pay for it <laughs> so they want you to pay, buy their product to do it because ETS at the end of the day is a company trying to make a profit so, yes. Why you GRE GMAT? Because of the content level, actually, and the way they ask questions. And we'll look at that in just a moment Well, when I get to compare contrast. So we'll look at some of the GRE-style questions and the GMAT-style questions. So, any other questions? These are all great questions. I like that you're willing to go up. Yeah. Um, so, I took the GRE like, a couple weeks ago, like the actual one. Mm -hmm. I didn't get the score that I wanted, probably because I didn't have like, as good of like, knowledge of it. I thought I did. Mm -hmm. um, like, this helped a lot because it really helped. Like, showing up a smile. But um, I was planning on retaking in October. And I was going to, like, late October, I was going to ask, like, if you advise it, if I should, like, wait till November so I can have, like, more adequate time to, like, prepare. It, a lot of it depends on your personal schedule. But um, if you already have taken the test and you're comfortable with the content, I would say that it, it's not necessary to have months and months to study. But like, since October is coming pretty fast, you might consider, okay, how much time can I actually devote to practicing? The best practice you can do, practice tests. Doing practice tests because you get used to the style, the way things are asked. So you know, I think you have a decision to make based on how much time I have available to practice versus when that test date's going to be. You know, so try to try to balance it out. Net yourself at least, you know, I'd say given where you're at, a hundred hours between now and then to take the or to practice before you take the real test. Yeah. So let's move on a little bit. Um, this is a multiple choice test. So multiple choice tests are crazy in that. Um, uh, well. There's statistic games you can play with them. The problem is with the GRE, the statistic games generally don't work because um, they have lots of different styles of questions. We're going to see some of the styles of questions that the GRE throws at you. So, let's see. 
been through that, been through that. So in the quant section, here's our quantitative section. What level is the highest level of math they're going to test you on in here? College, high school, middle school? High school. High school. Wait, what? You took all these math classes in college, <laughs> calculus and stuff, yet they're not going to test you on that to get into grad school. That's just completely silly. What's the lowest level they're going to dig down into? High school, middle school, grade school? Grade school. Yeah, grade school. Because there's things like least common multiple questions. <laughs> Greatest common factor questions. Those skills that you have not used since grade school are going to be on this test. And those skills you have not used since high school are going to be on this test. That's the challenge of the GRE, actually. It's not that you don't understand the math. You all can do the math. I guarantee you every person in this room could do the math that's required on this test, given enough time to figure out what the heck they're trying to ask you. So the thing is, that's part of prep, is to learn how is it they ask all these really silly questions. Because the math behind it, very simple, very simple. So you've just got to learn what those different types of, of things are they're asking you to do. And we'll, uh, we'll go through a couple examples. But they make it more difficult on you because they give you the worst possible calculator in the universe to use for it. Because they basically give you plus, minus, times, divide, square, and square root. And like nine numbers, ten numbers, zero through nine. So all those fancy functions on your fancy calculators you use for engineering, useless. They don't even give you sine, cosine for the trig questions. They, they don't even give you that. So... That's, it's a very simple, basic on-screen calculator. So if you're going to practice for the GRE, what you want to do is, is get one of those like, cheap calculators with very few buttons on it to practice with. If you practice with your good calculator, you're actually practicing the wrong way. You'll get dependent upon these other functions that will make the math easier. And here's the other thing. With this thing, it's limited to the number of digits it can go. So if you, like, do, if you have a number, it's asking you to do like 4 to the 12th, Minus 4 to the 11th won't work. The calculator will go error. Mm -hmm. So they basically set it up so certain questions will error out your calculator and you have to find a different way to solve it. Like factoring, which is something, again, you haven't done since when? Yeah. Forever. Sixth grade. Factoring. So, yes? So when you talk about the difficulty of questions, if you see something that was probably like, in grade school versus like high school, like should you be worried? Actually, no. Surprising, like the grade level of the content doesn't determine the difficulty of the question. The grade level of the content is just the span of the content. It's how they ask the question. So there's a lot of very complicated, wordy word problems that would be considered a harder question than something that's very straightforward. Like what is the when you evaluate this, what's the value? So there's, it, don't think about grade level versus difficulty. It's style of questioning versus, grade, uh, versus difficulty level. That's what it turns out to be. So there's a lot of different types of questions that come in. Multiple choice. Those are the usual ones. Select all that apply. So select all, oh, that's the verbal, sorry. Multiple choice is there. Select all that apply. Select all that apply, you actually have to click multiple boxes. So some questions will have more than one correct answer. Numeric entry, you have to actually just come up with a number and type it in. So one of the tricks I can tell you about numeric entry questions, if it turns out to be an irrational number for a numeric entry question, something that like has billions of digits after it, it's probably not correct. Because they're gonna, there's no way to grade that, like score it. So the numeric entry questions are going to be simple numbers like 12 or 5.2 or something that terminates. These answers better be rational when you answer them. So that's something to keep in mind. So everybody knows the difference between rational and irrational numbers? What's a good example of an irrational number? Pi. Pi. Pi goes on forever. Or E. Something like that. All right. Um, the verbal. Multiple choice, again. Select all the apply. And select in passage responses. They like these type because um, they basically give you a sentence with a couple blanks in them and say, which words fit in the blanks? So you've got three blanks in a question and you have to pick three words on one question. 
If I get two of the words correct and one of the words incorrect, do I get credit for the problem? No. All or nothing. It's all or nothing. So I've got to get all three words plugged in there to get it correct. So you want to make sure you start with the easiest word and go from there. So let's look at a few of these. Oh, by the way, verbal, reading comp, basically read a passage, read a paragraph, answer a question about it. Text completion, which basically fill in the blanks. And then sentence equivalence. Which of the following words would mean the same thing if inserted into the equation in the blank? So lots of different funky question types. So here's an example of a quantitative comparison question we see in math. So looking at those triangles there, you guys visually see any difference? No. Lesson number one, you cannot trust the figures on a quant comp question because the figures will often literally be the same except they'll change the numbers. That's like the same triangle just redrawn F versus G, 6.0 versus 6.1. And this is a structure they use on these quant questions, which is, and you don't even have to read the answers, you know the answers are always these, because it's always A is bigger, B is bigger, they're equal, or cannot be determined. So if I have a question like this, it's got numbers, it's a numerical answer, which answer is definitely wrong? The third one cannot be. Cannot be determined, because if there's a particular value, that means they have to be determinable. A has to be greater than B, or B has to be greater than A, or they could be the same. So for quantitative quant comp questions, that answer is never right, ever. Get rid of it. <laughs> She's writing this down. So if I'm looking at this now too, like look at the two triangles, what's different about them? The base is different. So is F and G going to be the same? No. So what other answer choice do I already know is definitely incorrect? Two quantities are equal, definitely out. This is the process we call POE, process of elimination. It's so much easier to get rid of answer choices than it is to pick the right answer that the first thing you should just go into is process of elimination mode. Get rid of this because of that. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. Get rid of this. Because... I mean, we're all really good at that. This is what, what, what is science all about? Proving stuff or disproving stuff? Disproving stuff. The scientific method is all about saying, well, if all these other things don't occur, therefore this must be the truth. And you've come up through engineering, you've learned the scientific method. And that's the way to approach your test. You know these rules. The rules is disprove everything because what's left must be true. So I can get the very least those two answers out. Now, does anybody know the property of triangles that can help me solve this? Ah, it's not about the 45 degree angles. One is equilateral, one is? This is equilateral, this is isosceles. And that's the rule, like, you've you got to bring that back out from geometry. What's that, 10th grade? Say again? You just did this? Uh, well, actually, you guys in engineering probably have an easier time seeing this, because I think you probably do this more often. <laughs> so you do it with other things, right? So at the very least, I know isosceles versus equilateral. So in the equilateral case versus the isosceles case, which vertical must be larger? The vertical F must be larger because it's an isosceles triangle than the vertical G because it's equilateral. So like, that's the math behind it. But at the very least, I could have gotten it down to two. And if I didn't know the rule, what could I have done? I would have been 50-50, guess, move on. So if I didn't know the rule, guess on the two of them, mark it, move on. If I do know the rule, answer it, and all is right with the world. So A is greater. Boom. Um, this is an example of a text, com text completion sentence. Now, here's the one thing about the GRE vocabulary. Remember, you guys took the SAT, SAT, how many people took ACT? SAT. So a lot of you took both, that's what it looks like. The vocab on the SAT used to be a lot harder than it is now. You guys don't have, didn't come from the era of really complex SAT vocabulary. That's unfortunate because 
that is what happens on the GRE. There's still that SAT era, like old era SAT vocabulary level. So one of the things you can do to start prepping right now is start bulking up your vocabulary. There's GRE word lists out there all over the place. Get a GRE word list. Do like word of the day. Put, put them on your calendar or something like that. I've got to learn a definition of each of these words, word of the day. Because that's how these questions work. You need to know what the words mean so you can figure out where the words go. So take a second, think in your head which word goes in which blank. Also think in your head which word is easiest to find first. And it can be different for different people. That's what we call pood, your personal order of difficulty. There might be a difference because of the type of engineering you're going into. Because I'm thinking some of our civil engineers might have an easier time with this than our chemi chemi chemical engineers and stuff like that. All right, so how many people think the first word's easiest to figure out? How many people think the second word? One of us. <laughs> Don't, don't be afraid. And how about third word? So a lot of us thought the first word. I personally felt it was the third word because I had at least some context for me because I saw bland or unappealing. Bland or unappealing, it, that should tell me what that word means. And so I went third word first. Would that be disparaged, embraced, or reclaimed? So offering designs in different quality subsequently but by those who feel that so if I'm viewing as bland or unappealing then I'm probably going to like it or hate it and which one means hate it disparaged so there we go now the next second this, the second word I went after was quite, uh, the first word because now I've got a little bit more context and I still do, I don't even know what a couple of those mean right what do some of these words mean oracular am I even pronouncing that correctly um, so, I went with this because they're talking about proponents of uh, reducing building purely functional form, found beauty in highlighting blah features. Now, like some of you guys are in architecture and stuff, probably are going like, what's the word? Aesthetic. Aesthetic, because they're talking about form and function. Oh, no, it's structural. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you got to take it into context and read the whole sentence with it. Proponents of the initial, an international style call for reducing buildings to purely functional form and beauty and highlighting blah features. They rejected references to, so if they're talking functional and form, structural would be the reason. Structural would be the reason. So what's my last word got to be? Oracular? Provincial or secular? Provincial styles. So, here's why. Let's look at the context again. They rejected references to the blank styles offering designs indifferent to location. Location, location is, the, is the verbal cue that tells me it's got to be provincial. So, here's what happens with these kinds of questions. We get so drawn in by the definition of what we think should be there rather than looking at all the other words around it. You've got to use the other words around it, not just what sounds good, what actually fits the other words around it. So, work, work these kinds of questions by looking at all the other clues they're throwing at you. They're going to give you clues, breadcrumbs, on how to solve these questions. So again, knowing the rules about these questions, the rules are, the answers are in the sentence already. They give you words that have similar meaning, you just got to match them. Make sense? So learn that rule about text completions. It has to match the sentence, not the definition. Um, here's another sentence equivalence, although typically quite lucid in his explanations of theories. James used words that were so blank. So don't, here's what I don't want you to do. Don't look at this yet. Okay. Don't look at that. Pick an answer. Pick a word that you think fits the blank. I know you can still read the words on me, but don't look at them. What, what do we got there? What do we want to put in the blank without looking at the answers? Unclear, Unclear difficult, complicated. Okay, so those are all good words. And that's what the strategy on a question like this. Pick your own word first 
and then see what other words match. So I, I, I'm going to go with complicated. I'm going to use complicated. So does realistic match complicated? No. What do I do? Keep it or get rid of it? Get rid of it. Obvious. Does obvious match complicated? No. Keep it or get rid of it? Abstruse. Do you even know what that means? No. So if you don't know what it means, keep it or get rid of it? Keep it. Because I don't know what it means. I can't. I, I have no reason to lose that answer yet. No reason to eliminate it. Benevolent, does that match? No. That's not complicated, so get rid of it. Obscure. Keep it. Keep, it. Keep it, because in this case, do we think it matches? I actually think it matches pretty good, so I'm not just going to keep it, I'm going to select it. Because okay. obs- ob- 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 obscure, complicated, that has a good meaning to match. Disparate, complicated. We're a little on the fence on this one. We're not sure. Disparate. Keep it or get rid of it. I'm hearing a few more get rid of it than keep it. Disparity versus complicated. It, 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 disparity is like comparing two things. It doesn't seem to fit. Let's get rid of it. But here's the rule. Again, you've got to know the rules. How many answers must there be on a sentence completion question? At least... Two. There has to be at least two answers on a sentence completion question. If you go into the test knowing that, and we did what we just did, then what other word must fit? Abstruse must also fit the answer. Because I know, I, only, I could only find one of these. I had no clue what abstruse meant, so I couldn't do anything with it. But, if, there's only two, if I have to have at least two answers for this question, then I know I've got to pick it. Like it doesn't say that in the directions for the question, no. Okay. It says that in the directions before the section. Okay. So this is like, basically they give you all this information in one big chunk before the section begins. And how many people read that? Like, oh, did you, or you read it and just, it's like, it's verbal vomit. It just goes right out your brain. So nobody's going to read that and keep it, keep it in, in their heads. So this is what you do. Learn the rules before you go into the test. And you're good to go. Because did you know that when you took your jury? See, yeah. So you knew that. So that was good. You knew the rules before you went into the test. That's how we beat this test. That's how we do it. Know the rules. So, let's see. Timing-wise, I know we're trying to keep... Ta- how much? Four minutes. Four minutes? Wow. Okay. So, let me talk a little bit about the jury. Compare, contrast it. So, the GMAT is for business school. It's similar because it's given continuously throughout the year. You sign up for it. That's a new thing, by the way. GMAT just changed the way it administers, or GMAC, G-M-A-C, changed the way they did this just recently. So there's a lot of uncertainty out there on the web about how the GMAT compares to the GRE, or the GMAT compares to what it used to be. So be careful on what you read. Caveat emptor. Um, It's given continuously. What's the median 500... Score, well, I just gave that one away. Duh. So, <laughs> what's the median score? Thank you. So, that's your 50th percentile. The biggest difference between this test and the GRE is it's adaptive by question. By question. Not by section, but by question. So, you have question one this time. If you answer question one correctly, what happens to the next question? It gets more difficult. What happens if you answer incorrectly? It gets easier. And now, while it's not like on a literally question by question basis, it does scale over time. So if you get more questions wrong at the beginning of the section than at the end of the section, that's really a huge hit on your score. So this test, even more than the GRE, question by question, you need to spend way more time on the first 10 questions in the section than you do the last 10 questions. Because you have to get those first questions right to start bringing your score range up. Because if you do not, after first 10 questions or so, some of your score starts to get predetermined. And so you're going to be stuck in that lower bracket. So you got about 10 to 15 questions to really nail your bracket for your final score. So that is a lot more challenging. So that's one of the big challenge differences between GRE and GMAT, is that right there. The other difference is the 
Math questions are a lot more bizarre. So this is the instructions for one of the GMAT math questions. The this is just the instructions. So you mean to tell me, like, you have to read all of these? How many minutes do you Well, need? here again, know the rules. This question is, or this set of rules is the same for every time you see it. So if you learn how these questions work ahead of time, you don't have to worry about reading this every single time. So yeah, I, I would be concerned if I had to read this every time myself. But know the rule before you go into the test, you're good to go. Like the saying, can I determine some value from two different statements? Either statement one alone, statement two alone, they both have to go together, each statement alone is sufficient, or statements one and two together are not sufficient. It's always the same setup for these kinds of questions. So I look at this and say, okay, what's the value of A? Is there a way for me to tell the value of A from that one equation right there? No. no. Because it's one equation uh, one or two unknowns, I can't do that. This is by itself sufficient or insufficient? Insufficient. insufficient. So, put them together, can I solve it? Yes. yes, I can. But then, they play the dirty trick. Every once in a while, they'll make sure they give you the same equation, but multiply by two. Oh. So, if they gave you, in here, instead, 14A mm -hmm. plus 4B equals 32. I can I do it with, do I need both equations to do it? Yeah. I still need both equations to do it, but the rules change a little bit because the fact that it's now the exact same equation. And so, no, I can't do it because it's the exact same equation. <laughs> if they're the same exact equation, I cannot actually determine what the actual value is. Oh. <laughs> right? So that's what makes the GMAT strategically different than the GRE, is the questions are a lot more logic-based. There's way more logic tested on the GMAT than the GRE. Other than that, the content of the two tests is very equivalent to one another. They're testing the same kinds of things in slightly different ways. G the GMAT wants to know how your mind works. The GRE wants to know that you can do things. <laughs> they, they basically want to know, can you jump through the hoops, more or less. The GMAT wants to know a little bit about how your mind functions. So, um, I know I'm basically out of time here. We'll skip over the uh, LSAT. That's LSAT stuff. So I just want to run through this as sort of our final thing. It's really, let's think about what standardized tests do. Number one, does a standardized test measure your intelligence? GRE, GMAT, whatever. No, that's not what they're for. Can it be used to help award your financial aid? Yes. Yes, it is. That's why you want to really work on, you know, get that score that you need for that financial aid package or program. Can it, does it reflect your undergraduate GPA? No. No, some people have awesome grades suck at taking tests because you don't know the rules. If you learn the rules, you can fix that. That's the whole thing that Einstein said, right? Know your rules. Predict your grad school GPA. No. no. Not even close. There's been so many studies done on this that it's, uh, it's cliche at this point. <laughs> can you prepare for these tests? Yes. yes, you can. And that's the big lesson to be learned here is, again, know how the test works and you're not going to have as many problems with this thing. Should you do it? What do you think? He's, he's not over there. Yeah, I, I definitely need to prepare for this test. And will it test what you learned in college? No. No, no it just doesn't. It's not a college-based test. So, like, yeah, get you into grad school, but it's not what they're testing. So, all right. So, let me just finish up by saying, um, basically what Princeton Review does, what our job is, is to help you guys learn those rules. So if you were to take a test prep course with Princeton Review and, or Kaplan, I'm not here to, to pitch Princeton Review, honestly. I'm here just to let you know how these tests work. But test prep course, whomever it's with. Basically, what you need to get out of that course is to learn how the questions work, how they function, how the test functions. It's not so much the content because you probably already know that. So when you're evaluating what test prep that you need to do, Think about what it tells you about the process, the strategies behind questions, the way the test functions, and that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck.